give you a quick overview of what we do, because a lot of things help me, I'm going to do that. And so the course today is a whole day workshop. It's a hands-on workshop, and it's aimed at developers. So if you are not a developer, then you're probably going to learn a lot today. <laughs> um, so just to, just to manage expectations, uh, we are going to go through you know, basic sort of stuff. I'm not going to explain what blockchain is. Is that OK? Does everyone here know? Who here knows confidently what blockchain in general means? Hands up. OK. I, if you, if you don't, just whisper to your neighbor and they'll quickly explain to you in a bunch of minutes. Um, so I'll just go through the basics of Soju and we will talk a little bit, uh, a little bit about you know, like how does it look like in terms of architecture, what are the, um, what are the differences, what do you need to know. Then we'll talk about transaction families, because this is where it really gets interesting. And uh, we will try to get you into as much hands-on coding as possible. There's going to be a lot of Docker <laughs> waiting for Docker to do things. Um, so we will try to get you set up with everything. And we want to build a transaction family together, which we're very basic one. And then later, um, we will also tell you more about SEP, which is the Ethereum like the Solidity implementation for Sawtooth, which means you can run Solidity smart contracts um, in the Sawtooth network. And then we'll also build a Solidity smart contract here and apply it on the So, you know, it's relatively broad. We're going to chip the surface. There's a lot of new stuff. Uh, I mean, you know, as we were building content, it's constantly looking at documentation, trying something out, and that doesn't work, and so we have to look into the code. And so it's, there are going to be rough bits in here, and it's possible that something doesn't work in your machine. You know, we'll, we'll try to troubleshoot together as much as possible. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll try to get you working with the command line and uh, coding as much as possible today. So the day today looks like this. We'll, we have a break between uh, 10.30 and 10.45. And then we have lunch, and then there is an afternoon break. And I think during the afternoon break, there is someone who's doing something about the fabric. Uh, yeah. That's pretty much it. Yes. Questions? Are we supposed to, to have received something? Yes. Have, if you, um, you email, OK, let me, let me check. I probably I have a few more to, to process. So I'm going to invite you to all of that as well. Um, one of the first steps that we're going to do is going to be, um, it's going to be installing uh, an <coughs> image of a container or a series of containers with set in it, just because it takes a long time to set everything up. So you don't have to understand what you're doing necessarily. Um, I'm going to quickly invite everyone. Give me one minute. We're pretty much full. I mean, we can, during the intro, you're welcome to sit in, but in terms of the, the setup for coding, space because we, we kind of have a limit of 30 people so you can sit in for the intro part but then it would be great if you find another one I'm, I'm adding it now um, are there any other questions about today? So who here um, has already worked with sort of? Okay. Uh, who here knows Solidity? Oh, 
Who has deployed Sotrick into production? Okay, great. <laughs> Uh, sent out more um, more invitations. So have a look. It should be arriving now. Um, also, so if you are in, can you go to the second subsection, which is um, SOTU, and there is a subject section, my first network. And I would ask you to start that process because there is a lot of waiting involved. And depending on your machine and depending on things, it might take the whole of my intro to finish installing, and you might run into issues. So we'll start it now, I will do the intro, and then if you have trouble, we can troubleshoot as we go along. Are we supposed to get an email? Yeah, you will be receiving an email. And if you don't, I mean, check the spam, but it should be, you should be receiving it straight away. I'm still inviting uh, four more people. And if you haven't sent me the email, now would be the time. <coughs> yes, one course. On your dashboard, you, you should see the Avalanche sort of introduction for developers and Avalanche Global Summits. No, you have no books. Did anyone else have the course? So you you can see? Okay. Can you send me it? First bit is just going to be set up. Uh, can you send me another... Which... What is your name? We had a second mail, we didn't see it. Oh, okay. Okay. No, we can it. oh perfect. perfect. Awesome. Go to dashboard in the top bar. You have a link to dashboard. That's where you see. <coughs> Are you through with all the emails? Um, mm -hmm. 
I know this is a bit tedious, but um, there's a lot of kind of going along with, uh, with instructions. So it's going to be helpful. As you can see, the glory that is NX. Okay, so. Okay, so most invitations should be out now. You'll receive yours within the, you know, if you haven't received it now, you'll receive it within the next half minute or so. <coughs> Who has Docker installed already? Did this remember? All right, cool. Um, if you haven't got Docker installed, uh, who here has Docker installed and who here has Docker not installed and is on Linux? I guess I'll No. And that's not a problem. <laughs> hmm? You need Docker Compose and Docker. Yes. You need Docker C, well, Do I would say Docker C and Docker Compose. <coughs> um, so, yes, go to the Sawtooth subsect section, my first network and go through the install steps of that. Just kick that off now, because it takes a while until then, you know, when I'm done talking about some of the fluffier things we can actually start to start with. When you find your link, hmm? when you find your link, the first network? It is in the, if you go on course, <coughs> in the content, on the left side, there's a subsection sort of. And in that subsection, in the left navigation, you can see a section called My First Network, called The First Network. Actually, I can, I've got this big screen, I can bring this up. Yes, yeah okay you still running through it but um, look. Yes. Two more. All right. So um, on the left side here, you can see uh, sort of, and then first network. So that should be going relatively quickly. And then um, after that, in transaction families, there is the set section. And this is the bit that is a bit more chunky. So, because you have to fix something, just follow the instructions. You have to update the Docker file because the uh, other one is broken. Um, so you just update the Docker file and go through the process here. And there are detailed instructions there. So, this goes, um, you basically stop at the contract example, so it's just about setting that, so that we are running that way. <coughs> so the, the first step is, sorry, sorry this is a bit, uh, <laughs> so first network, we just kind of pulled this first because we realized yesterday that it takes a long time for the step section to pull it apart. Yes. Oh, yeah, I mean, I'm just <coughs> so usually we would obviously start with the introduction, but in order for everyone to be ready, 
we need to do this first. Did everyone receive an invite? Anyone without invites? Do you send me an email? Yeah. Cool. All right. I can't see the call. I could be activating. Fresh, you have that one. You will receive a second email after registration if this has a new thing. Yeah, it's not working. Um, well, technically. Uh, my uh, my 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 I don't see the user account for this email for some reason. There was a question here? <coughs> Sorry? You haven't received the phone call? Yes. On Windows, I didn't test on Windows. I am, I am not sure it should work. It should be fine. I mean, it should be fine. But the sad part um, needs some scripts to go on. For the concern of the price, not for the it's quite long. Oh. It can't start on the end. Oh, shit. Okay, just, let's just try. Let's try, yeah. with, let's try together. Yeah. Or just. Call me your admin. <laughs> Say like I need admin, but it's right now. How it works? It won't happen. Do you like? 
Because that's going to be all right. We should have now have an event book. Um, and you, I, you must be registered under a different email. Mm -hmm. so that's that was the purpose you should have. So just just in your accounts and things which you know you are um, signed up as. Because I can invite you to the post and once I know which one you send up as. Um, Hmm? In your account settings. Uh, Amen? Yes. Can you check with him which email he's registered at? Because then I'll get started now. Here. Um, yeah. Just check which email he registered signed up with. And then see the Okay. But you should now also have the like the same distance. All right, so I think you know we'll troubleshoot for those where there is still issues to so figure that out. But I think they are generally good. Who started on the on this process, the first network? Okay. Um, has anyone started on the Ceph part yet? That's nice <laughs> okay. All right. So just keep that going um, and keep an eye on it while it's running. I'm going to do a quick intro on. Yes. Um, Right, I will just, as I said before, uh, Martin tells me that I'm going to have to tell you just very briefly about us. Um, so, as before, we are b Lab. We do blockchain education. Uh, we started in, started doing this in 2015, when, you know, Ethereum started looking like it was actually going to do something and work. And we built an Ethereum developer course, Ethereum developer solidity course, in 2015, and kind of put it out there, and people wanted it. So we shut down whatever else we were doing before and just focused on education. And uh, we've been doing it ever since. And we focus on education and talent. So we teach people, and then we help people find a job, or we help people start a project. And that's that's what we've been focusing on. No ICOs, no crazy schemes, nothing. But just teaching people. Um, we have we have about you know we have over fifty thousand people on our platforms. We've trained one thousand five hundred people through our kind of in-depth programs. Um, our courses look like this: you join, uh, you can join with a subscription either for an individual course or for all courses together on our platform. Uh, you can pace yourself going through the course. We recommend a module per week. That's kind of how it's set up. If you have a, you know, if you if you do a lot of work, if you have full time, you can obviously do it in your own time. Uh, we have a certification exam at the end, where gentlemen like, or our team, people like uh, Anil, will scrutinize what you've built, um, and then if it's up to standard, we certify you. Um, so we have this for Ethereum, Quorum. Fabric, Sawtooth, we launched, well, Sawtooth, we're launching next week, 
who they'll be launching next week, EOS next year, and so on. So there's a whole range of things that you can do. Um, we've got students from 125 countries, not all to overstate it. Uh, most of these are through our online academy. We also do on sites for companies, like two or four day seminars. We are neutral, so this is the important bit. We're not trying to sell you any of the individual things that we teach. We have a technical steering group internally. We look at the tech. If we like it, if we think it's good, we come with us. And we also have a program where um, companies can order bigger courses and run their people through it. So we also do that for content for others. We are a high pleasure member today. And we're also a member of the forward to that as well. Um, cool. Just for those who have arrived in the meantime, um, the first part is kind of set up. I will do a quick introduction. We set up the network. We have a brief break. We'll talk about transaction families, staff, and solidity. Then the second part of the day after lunch is pretty much for building stuff. So we are going to build a simple transaction family and kind of set some set some goals. You know, get some handsome coding done. And in the last bit. We'll see how far we get. It's a lot of stuff, and there are a lot of things that can, that can go wrong along the way. So, um, depending on how far we get, we will also do a bit of solidity, build a simple smart contract, run it on set, and kind of show you where more interesting things are happening at the moment. So, whoops, that was a bit too fast. Um, I will do a quick intro on. Uh, also, sort of so again, can I see who already knows how sort of works? Cool. Well, you can correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, so, to obviously, one of the um, one of the Appalachia projects donated by Intel. Thank you, Intel. Um, we the it, it doesn't have uh, node specialization, so you know they are open space. You have nodes. Each node contains a validator, a validator containing journal and state. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, we have a, a genesis block that's similar to other um, functions, and then the interesting bit, or at least the bit where I, that I find interesting in sort of is uh, transaction families. So transaction families are, first of all, really a, um, a, a set of rules that says what kind of transactions are valid, and it's a way to implement uh, logic. Right? So it can really be anything. It's super versatile. Uh, or well, not anything, but it, it is very versatile. So it could be, for example, um, there is an example in the documentation that implements a kind of bonds trading implementation. Um, or, alternatively, you can also implement the EVM, the Ethereum Virtual Machine, and that Solidity Contracts run uh, in, um, in the network. So transaction families have, they have their own namespaces, and you can run different transaction families in the same network. Um, the each node has a you know like to, to interact with the node, you interact with the node through a REST API, and then obviously you can you know, build different clients that connect with that and web interface with the mobile app. Um, then so just to dig in a little bit into the um, so each validator contains a, um, a journal, which is kind of the ledger keeper. So these are all um, the whole of Soto is super modular, which. I mean, it's, it's kind of modular to a crazy degree, which means technically you can switch out and exchange all of these different sub-functions and plug in something else. I mean, I'm saying plug in 
uh, you, you probably have to, you know, have to do a lot of work and you have to craft the plug. But uh, still, you know, it's, it is built for modularity, which means that you can exchange things. And that's, for example, um, that's improved a lot more with uh, version with the release of version one. So um, it is now easier to implement different uh, contents mechanisms and stuff like that. Uh, so the um, the journal is also the part of the node that keeps you know that that both make sure that uh, it has you know, the, the latest version of the of the box and it keeps the box, um, but it also um, it also has you know things like the, the focus on, for example. So looking at this, this is kind of similar to public blockchains where each individual client checks for itself whether it's on a fork or not. Um, but all of this, yeah, all of this is part of the journal. Uh, the journal has a completer that guarantees that the blocks are complete. Um, a block publisher that verifies. Um, it verifies batches and includes them in candidate blocks for that one. And um, batches are kind of another level down. So we have individual transactions with batches and then with blocks. So batches are uh, transactions are crafted, they're put into batches. And the interesting thing with batches is so usually uh, in many other platforms, you can introduce transactions, individual transactions, but you have no control over in what, in what order they are going to be included in the block. Um, whereas a batch is a way for you to craft transactions and make sure that if any of them, is, uh, if they are going to be executed, they are going to be executed as a block. So it's a little bit like a transaction in SQL. So, hmm? Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, the, what you said was either all transactions in that batch are going to be executed or none of them at all. So this is, for, for those of you who know Solidity, this is very similar to a function called Solidity, where either the whole function is executed or it's not executed at all. Um, then, a uh, quick note on... A uh, quick note on the consensus mechanisms. So originally, uh, so to is built with uh, proof of elapsed time as a consensus mechanism. And that is really, it's a, it's a way to do a lottery, right? So because we want to make sure that no one can individually keep issuing blocks and have any specific favor in the network. So proof of elapsed time is a way to achieve that. If you have a, uh, an execution environment that's uh, trusted and can't be, can't be manipulated. So, um, Intel originally conceived this in connection with the SGX with the chip, so that you can, uh, you can run, the, or the, the, the SGX chip will provide a certificate and will basically ensure that in the whole network if everyone's running this, there is a fair lottery of who can produce the next block, right? So um, the way that this works is the validator creates, so each validator can, um, can create blocks. The validator creates a wait timer, which the trusted environment gives them a random number within bounds that tells them how long they're going to have to <coughs> wait until they can create a block. And then once that timer is run off, they can get a certificate that they have waited that amount of time, and they can sign. Uh, they can use that to, to issue the block. Basically. So this means that the right to create a block is randomly distributed, and no one can individually kind of um, skew that to their favor. <coughs> yeah. Uh, can they be sure that uh, we, 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 did not, we, we did not just create the, the type that we would like to create? So. The, the question was, how can we be sure that we didn't just create, that we didn't just make up the time that we that we had to wait? So this is where, where SGX comes in, right? So it's a trusted environment that can sign. So the certificate is basically a signature that says the chip 
says that this code has been executed the way that it was conceived. Right? So um, there are other approaches. Uh, I know that, for example, there is a um, there is a provider that spins up Amazon instances specifically like you can verify that they have been created after a certain template and they don't have access keys. So they run and then they shut down afterwards. So the idea is that everyone in the network who sees the key can knows in that case that the code that, that the waiting timer code has been executed without the um, the validator being able to influence it. So, um, just if you, if you didn't hear, there is a uh, SGX allows for remote attestation where other machines can verify that. The, um, that the, the wait time script was executed in that environment. It's basically a yeah, validation mechanism. I mean, and, and there are other mechanisms that, that enable this, but this is obviously, it's a, it's a neat way, and it's also a neat way <laughs> to tie into SGX. Um, there, are, there are other ways of, uh, of achieving this, yes? <coughs> is it possible that uh, two WD timestamps are the same? Well, technically, technically, two validators could be allowed to create a block at the same time, and that's when uh, a fork occurs. And there are different ways that a fork can be resolved, but basically, each individual validator will look at where they are, and they, you know, obviously, they keep they keep talking to other nodes, and if they notice that there is uh, that there is a clash and there are two valid blocks, mm -hmm. we're both the last block then um, the fork resolver, and this is part of the journal uh, that, we, that we talked about earlier, so the, the ledger keeper will then resolve the fork depending on, I mean, th there are also different mechanisms. Um, do you know which uh, fork resolver mechanism? What he said. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> um, yes, so it's basically, you know, the, the idea is that you that you don't allow an individual validator to uh, just keep writing notes. And because we're not in a public network, it doesn't really matter. We don't need to necessarily enforce um, long, long times. And uh, yeah, it's really, it's, it's just a way to, it's a way to safely distribute that uh, across the network. So is there any uh, confirmation number here? Is there a what? Confirmation number. In what sense? To confirm the no, but because it's it's a it's a different uh, because this is a it's a controlled environment, right? So um, in in Ethereum, you have to assume, or in Bitcoin, um, let's say in Bitcoin, you have to assume that someone has fed you malicious data, or that uh, you know you, you have malicious actors in the network. Um, so you, you don't have to wait for a number of, uh, of, of validations to be sure that it's you know. So you 
assuming that there is a finality once the blood is created with finality. It's just like the push of blood, except that the blood portion is replaced by the time. Yes. So it's, it's like proof of work, but uh, the work portion is replaced by time. <laughs> if it is higher, it's much probable to have any given point of time, there's a given probability that you have got this point. And to be changed, the government has a network which has a network that 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 has a lower rate time and a higher probability. So, uh, yeah, the, the thing with also with the, with the folks is that there is always only a probability that you're operating. Because it might be that you are on a fork that is going to be discarded. Um, and it's important that <coughs> the enforcement of this rule comes through individual nodes acting uh, according to the same rules. There is no central authority that set, settles it, but they all act, they, they all um, act based on the same rules, which eventually means that you converge on uh, on the main chain, and there is consensus again. Sorry. But validators may be malicious. Validators might be malicious, but it depends on your network. I mean, they might be. Yeah. This is the reason for the for this uh, set test, right? Yeah. So um, that that you can test if um, someone is speak up a bit. too too often uh, winning the lottery, right? You have, I mean, there is. One thing is um, to the to the fork resolution. Um, it is the longest time rule um, in Southwood. This in 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 um, Bitcoin, you know, maybe the um, longest chain. Rule. So here, we, um, if you, if the validator has two forks, it looks for the um, for the chain with the longest time, longest wait time. And yeah. So the chain with the longest collective wait time. Yeah, for I mean it depends on the consensus which one you, you select. Yes, of course. So I but if we if we talk about proof of elapsed time, yes, then it then is the longest long victory. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because the so there should be some period of the Can you repeat the questions that you uh, have uh, the I'll repeat as best I I think so there is a theoretical possibility of fork happening. There is a possibility of fork happening, yes. Yeah. So Absolutely. the only question was the number of which <coughs> one should break for the fork, assuming that there are transactions. But there should also be a theoretical value there as well, because the fork will happen. So there is a chance that you're Transaction could be kicked out because they have a longer chain to select. Yes, it's very deep. It, it depends on your use case. Um, it depends on how big your network is. So if you have a very large network, there's a larger chance that you might have both the very small network. And then it um, also depends on that latency and things like that. So and how critical it is for you to have very fast finality. Um, if you really want to have fast finality, you for it to do that. So uh, I think the, the key thing in here is that there are there are no um, there are no set values that will, and there are no well, there are going to be more best practices, but it really depends on your use case. You you're going to deploy your own or you're going to work on a specific use case, and it might be in some cases. You know, you might need settlement once a day, so it doesn't really matter whether you have finality within 10 milliseconds or something. Uh, and again, also, it depends on the size of the network and it depends on the network latency. So a fork can appear when two validators uh, create a valid block without knowing about each other. You know, so if it's like one millisecond apart and the block can't propagate through the network quickly enough, that's when a fork might happen. So in a network that is uh, spread across many different um, locations and has large latency, or you have a you have part of the network that is, for example, cut up from the other, like say you have a data center 
in um, San Francisco, you have a data center in, in China where you know, the connection between the two might have a lot of latency or you know, an inspection or something, then you, you need to change your expectations and you need to change the way that your application uses, the, um, uses your network. So it might be that you wait a bit longer before you act on whatever comes up. Yeah, another question? Yeah, uh, what position does it wait? Uh, what, what? What position? What position? Yeah. How likely is that I'm blocking? Online? Again, it depends. <laughs> it depends on the network. Like milliseconds, nanoseconds? So it depends on how, um, I mean, milliseconds. But it, it depends on how long it takes to reconcile. Like, if you have one node, then obviously you have going to have a problem. If you have two nodes that are within the same network, you're not really going to have a problem. If you have just two nodes that are very far apart, or you have a very large network where propagation takes longer, then it might be that's a different question. Yes, then. You're going to have a <laughs> it's really well, like the focus not necessarily having exactly the same elapsed time. Like you, and also, it's not about the uh, elapsed time because they might be on different rhythms, or they will be, but it's about whether they create blocks so close to each other um, in terms of the time that the that before before they both know about each other's block, they have already created both the part block. And then you have two battle blocks that are different. And that's that's a problem. <laughs> that's exactly what the full resolution is designed to do. Yeah. Uh, the way of doing certificate calculation, wait time of calculation is designed to do is to randomly distribute the wait times based on the population. If you have only three validators, your window in which to select the wait time will be smaller. You, you, you have to select I want to publish a blog every day. And then you will, if you have only three validators, you will, the, the random window in which you can select a time will be smaller. If you have a hundred more networks and you want to publish one blog every 30 seconds, your window in which you select a random time will be much bigger. Right? Because you want, you don't want as far as possible um, to have a lot of validators publishing a block at the same time. You want to minimize the number of blocks that are floating around at any given time. So for a hundred node network, you have a very large window from which to choose your random wait time from. And then even then, if you have blocks that are completely strong for the for being the game head, then you have all these block validation rules and open validation rules to see who has the lowest line, who has the most population that is registered with them, uh, and <coughs> all of those are tied. Then, uh, what is the uh, the other kind of rules? Automatically, who has the lower validator ID that is being chosen? Okay, okay. There were some other questions. I was exactly my question. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Do we experience kind of a pressure from the network as the scale moves the number? Yeah. Because all situations can be more and more. So the network has to kind of all the resolve first the stocks and then the work. So. Um, so the question is whether there, there's a, it creates some kind of backstop or bottleneck in when the network gets larger and proper resolution happens. Not really, because the network doesn't wait, because um, there is no central, again, there is no central authority that enforces anything across the network. I think like one of the key things is always you have individual agents, you have the nodes, they are independent agents, and they work according to the same set of rules most of the time. And um, so them in lockstep taking the same decisions and having the same understanding of data creates a kind of overarching um, that creates a consensus and that creates you know the appearance of a uh, coordinated network, but they each decide on their own. So when a fork happens, there is no resolution, any central resolution, but it's individual validators taking decisions about which chain 
and which of the two chains is the right one. But there might still be two plus by network uh, creating new blocks. So for example, if we have two clusters um, where there is latency between the clusters, a validator in one cluster creates a valid block and at the same time as in another cluster, another validator creates also a valid block. So we have a fork. Then in this cluster, another validator might operate on the assumption that this is the latest block and create a new block. So basically, they keep going at you know, similar speeds um, and they keep growing, right? So there is no, um, there's no backstop, there's no bottleneck, but one of the chains is going to be discovered. One of the forks. So this is when a, an, an individual validator receives conflicting information. So for example, if I'm a validator and I have as the last block this one, and I talk to another validator and that last valid block is a different one, but it's also not, um, it, it's clearly not a later one. Like it's, it's not a new one that I can add, but it's on a different chain. Then that's when the internal fork resolution uh, decides which one to which one to take. So this is on the individual level that fork resolution happens. And the idea is that eventually consensus um, is restored because as the information propagates through the network, each individual validator is going to make the same decision about the <coughs> chain to choose. And then eventually the chain with the least wait time is going to be phased out. This is not much different from how we Yeah. Except that the metric that you are using to decide on the winner is a different metric. Yeah. And to calculate that metric, you don't have to put churning around a whole bunch of patches. You just have to set up a time and that's it. Another question. Yeah. In the case of the fork, of course, if you can face a situation when, uh, say, I made some transactions where they were accepted, uh, but later on you find out that uh, unfortunately the transactions ended up in the fork that was dropped. Yes. Is there an internal mechanism that uh, will provide some resolution for that, or, do you have, or, or something needs to be uh, developed on the application level? So I need to say, hey, I need to resubmit my transaction so that we get into the main chain. So this would be, mm -hmm. there is no internal resolution, okay. but um, you would have to make sure that your application, like if anything important is being acted on off chain, because on chain you always have. Um, you know, because, for example, if we have a function call that changes the value, like that changes the value, and then we have another function call that operates on that value, and those are in one chain that gets discarded, that will never happen. So it's basically each transaction changes the state, right? So each transaction that is added to a block changes the state. So as the blocks keep being added, the state changes. But if one of the uh, forks is discarded, the other state is the one that is being used. So that basically, it might be that there is a whole chain of events that never happened, and this place is then you're going to have to repeat that action on the on the. So we okay. we, we really have a, a, let's say a consensus mechanism that is exactly like uh, so exactly. Uh, you need you need to, to get to, to have or define. To was depending on the use case, some let's say uh, some buffer of a number yes. of blocks depending on network setup and metrics and so on, so that you can say I'm good to go. Yeah, transaction is definitely in the range. Almost probably. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so your first question, um, your client doesn't need to worry about when the worry about it submitting the transaction, it submits it at some point. Whether it's a forking consensus mechanism or a fast analytic mechanism or whatever, that is not the clients, that is not something the client should worry about. Um, the way it works in sort of this when a transaction comes in, the validator keeps a copy of that transaction and forwards it to the network. So the transaction propagation happens <coughs> and then eventually based on the consensus mechanism, at some point the log will get created and uh, and forwarded. So it's very likely that whether your block wins or not, the block that eventually wins yeah. will indeed have a transaction that you submitted. Yes. 
even though the, the trial data that you sent the, uh, the transaction to does not have a very problem. So it might be that your transaction will in relation have happened at a very different time to go at it at a different at it at a different time, but it's likely that it's still there. But I mean, this is why uh, if you're building a client, um, it's always worthwhile thinking of the network as you know as your state machine. And so you, you're just creating an interface for the state, uh, which means you shouldn't have, you know, you shouldn't necessarily assume and have local copies and that kind of stuff. Um, but ideally, just work on the state that is in the, uh, that, that you get to the node. So can you call that simple version of the group? Like, like, for, for now, yes. <laughs> Um, I mean, eventually there's going to be yeah, one. Yes, so exactly. Not, so you can, I keep in mind that uh, your administrator may choose to uh, just use a, a consensus mechanism like RAP or PDX, yes. which is a path tunnel in your mechanism. Yeah. Right? You don't have the client need to worry about this. And you can subscribe to events from all to. We will say you give your callback once your contact is committed. So, right? so you just submit it and just wait for the event. Yeah, so from the from the client side, definitely you don't have to worry about it. If you if you keep going and you start, you know, setting up your networks and trying to fit that to a use case, those are things that are important on the admin on the network setup side. So you need to think about for the use case, how quickly we need finality, you know, for high likelihood of finality, um, and you know what does your network look like. How many locations are there? So this, like all of the problems that we've talked about, the potential problems that are similar to proof of work, really only will be the case in very large networks with network latency and using proof of labs type. If you're using a different consensus algorithm, like Alaska um, PBFT, then that will be that would be a different question. So it really depends on, on the use case. If you're a client developer, you don't worry about it at all. If you are not with network admin, you can write transaction for the second stuff that or even then, that's not the But if you if you are the architect and you set up the network, you're gonna have to think about it. Yeah? So the way I understand that we should treat the, the request, the right request that you sent in the network and GDP. So my question is that related to your question, is there an SDK or a library which you can set to the, the, the um, your latency in the network that, that you're uh, targeting for web and you can set the consensus mechanism so that it helps you kind of uh, reading off to see if it really has been accepted by the chain or is that something you have to do manually? Is there like any well, tool I mean, to help here? So you can use events, right? Which really is. Uh, is a very sensible way to go about it because technically, if it's going to be fast, but technically you don't know how long it takes between you sending it to a block, you passing a transaction on and copying it, you know, it activates on validators and it being included in a batch in a block, right? So the best way to go about it in most cases would be you, you wait for the event and you build the application so that the uh, submission, the, the, the triggering of action and then the callback of that are um, you know, separate. It's a callback basis. The callback is called when, when the transaction is in the block, but it's not aware if you're in the block at this point. No. You cannot tell. So you can give up. Well, I mean, think, but by definition, you can't tell because obviously for the other node, it's, yeah. All, it's always, whatever you actually get from the node, because it starts with. To the best of my knowledge. Yes. <laughs> but again, most of the time, I would say 99% of the time, if you're going to use Sawtooth uh, in most enterprise environments, um, you, this is not going to be a problem. I mean, it's, it's good to think about it, it's good to think about it, but it's not going to be a problem. Yes? Is there any guarantee that the callback comes from, like, that the, the network has achieved consensus and there's no chance of working? When you get a callback, is there any guarantee or <laughs> Well, I mean, you can set it so that the likelihood is great enough for you. I mean, again, if, when you build this, it's always a question of what is your risk profile 
and um, you know what kind of causality do you need? You can you know you can tweak things so that you only get uh, or you only add to the callback after so and so much more time has passed. Or you know you can you can set these things depending on your risk model. If you don't you know if it's not about moving hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and it has to be within like one of a second. Uh, you know, most of the time you, you are not going to necessarily need to alter engineer that part. And this is, I mean, even in public networks, if you're building a similar, if you're building a client for Ethereum, most of the time you're not going to have a problem. And that is, that, those are much longer ways. Well, I'm thinking mostly about the risk that scenario, where you could have but one data center is kind of continuing and validating blocks, and then other data center is doing the same thing. And yes. What happens when it's when it resolves? Well, one of the folks is going to be discovered. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when you get your callback, you might want to make sure you have like at least one and a half of the. Again, depending on your risk profile, but yeah. Okay. So, the first one is high finance, very good finance. What are you trading off the books? What am I using by having super fast finance? Well, you pay your. Uh, so, uh, so, 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 the so, so, the question was uh, what do I use if I have super fast finance? For many years? We have to update the business to wrap the data. Yeah. So, wrap does not give you. Uh, this is a big the problem is that they don't scale very well with mass analysis. So the, the answer was there are two other um, mechanisms that are going to be well that one is beta, one is an alpha, graph and the fifty. Um, and you were saying they don't scale very well to large yeah, numbers. We have maybe a dozen nodes, twenty nodes, yeah, fifty, hundred nodes. You don't have an option but yes. Which is very inefficient for but as you, you start going, uh, that inefficiency starts getting more stuff. So, so, yeah, so I have a lot more to go in there. There's a lot more Sorry? There's a lot more to go in there. No, no, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's fine. Um, do you want to. Hmm? Do you want to talk about So I know it's going to tell you more about transaction families. I want to just check it for a second. Oh, okay. Okay, um, I think we talk about this. 
um, maybe one thing that is interesting um, is how the messages are handled by Apple or the um, Like in Fabric, it uses gRPC. It's useful because you can go into this uh, repository and look for these um, definitions of these messages, and they will tell you something or a lot about the structure. So, for example, we have here a um, definition of a batch, which gives you an idea about what it uh, includes, um, which kind of um, it has a signature, um, it has tr a list of transactions. Th that is a very general protocol, gRPC. Um, you can look for it, and you will face this um, very often if you if you go into the data, if you want to know um, which kind of message you need to create, for example, for your client, or if you want to change a component. We told already you can almost modify everything you want, but you have to keep an eye of these um, messages in their structure. And also, you can learn a lot from them. So here, block message. Um, let's go here. Elias talked already about the journal. Yeah, the transaction family. Um, okay, so Southwood has a very specific way to implement business logic or smart contracts. It is called transaction family. It has three components, or yeah, you can describe it with three components. Um, one, and the, I think the, um, one big component is the transaction processor. That is the component which the <coughs> validator will um, communicate to, see if a transaction is valid or not. So it's the important part. Another big part is the client. Because the client will need to create the transactions and the transaction payloads and can create the batches and will need to sign them and will need to send them to the vault data, which will then look, um, will look for the transaction processor. And in this step, it needs to know which kind of transaction it is, which kind of transaction family it is. And so it is also um, included in, uh, we, we see here the payload, it is also in included in the transaction message. This, this is just a part of the transaction um, the part of buff definition. It's not the whole definition. So that means we can send, um, we can, in one network, we can have very different types of transaction families and create transactions for them and run them at the same time. And also we ha can have different versions. So all these um, different things are coded in this protobuf definitions. But yeah, I just wanted to start directly now the, the network. I think everyone has now Docker Compose and Docker. And some have still problems. Let's see. Um, yeah, Nice. Yeah. Oh, we can also yeah. zoom in. Do you want to zoom in? How do you zoom in? So this is a typical Compose file. Who, who worked already with Docker Compose before? OK. So Docker Compose, then, then I mean, then there are a lot of people who didn't, right? So um, 
Docker Compose is a way to, to manage different Docker container. And a Docker container is um, kind of running virtual machine, but a very, um, a very light one comparing to a real virtual machine. So what we are going to do is we can, um, we will have different container. There are the definitions of, of those. And they will run all at the same time. And they will interact with each other. And you will see here we have a world data that was a main component for, um, for maintaining the blocks. And we have here different transaction families already included in this sample, which is offered by Apple Just um, We have we will talk about these transactions families. We will um, run some and send some transactions to the to the network. And we have the REST API and the shell which we which we will use. So we will see how we can do a call here and how we can run a command here. And it's How? You mean the settings? It is also a transaction family. It is for on-chain uh, on settings, changing uh, settings on-chain. So um, yeah, it is made for for on-chain settings, like who can, who has the permission to send a transaction, um, who has a who has the permission to change a setting, um, who has permission, I don't know, to, um, yeah. So the it's, it's basically, so transaction families allow you to encode certain, um, certain processes or certain, um, you can basically implement functionality, and the, the, this transaction family is basically um, a way for you to store settings that you plug into the network. So it's it basically rather than hard coding into um, a front file or something like this, basically you use the network to set the uh, to you use the functionality of the network to implement the services that are then being used on the network. That's kind of dog food game second. So that's why you say that the solution is very difficult. Yes, so uh, exactly. So um, the, the comment was that this is why uh, so this is very uh, flexible, very viable, and that's the basic idea. So you can do you, with the transaction families, you can implement kind of almost anything that you might want to do in terms of functionality or processes. You can use it to encode, um, you know, bonds trading or supply chain or whatever. You can use it to build an application platform or a uh, execution platform on which you can execute. Other code, uh, it's very versatile, and you don't need to do that. We'll go through how to build the same company. That's going to be one of the biggest tasks today. Okay, yes, go on. Now, also, if, if you look at the um, definition for a block, you will see you can also change the consensus on a running um, blockchain. That's, I think, something very impressive. Uh, so you can uh, switch um, the setting. Okay, to start the network, that should be. One question. Yes. If I, if I change those settings, I have to bring down and bring up the network. No, no. You can do this on an, in a running network. So there are, there are some steps um, one needs to, to run before a network can be started. And this, this Compose file is doing those steps for us. So we can have a look which kind of steps we need. Um, we see we need a genesis block for the blockchain, which will be created with this, um, with this key which will be also generated. This is 
important because if you want, for example, um, if you want a setting change, you will need this keys, this um, this node who created the Genesis block for the first time. He, this node can add other nodes and give them the permission to do also changes on the uh, on the settings. But um, the Genesis, I mean, you can call this node the Genesis node, which creates the the Genesis block. And so it's one thing that needs to be made. Then the other thing is um, all the transaction processor. So each transaction family has a transaction processor, and it needs to um, bind to the well data. So that's also something that this Docker Compose file is doing for us if we just start the network. Let's see if there's something. <coughs> yes? The transaction family and transaction processor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Each, yes, each transaction family has a transaction processor. Yes, yes. Um, it has a handler. We will see this. Um, yeah, but because the world and also for the version, the world data gets a transaction, and this transaction message is um, included which kind of transaction family it is, and it will look then for the transaction processor which can handle with this kind of transactions, and then look for the. Verification. Yes? Uh, you mentioned the, uh, the Genesis node, let's say. How does, is, is this a single instance? Or how ah, you mean is there a way to create together a Genesis block? I mean, how, do, how does that affect the, uh, let's say, the, the management by sorting or setting is not necessarily uh, trust each other? Someone has to kind of separate some, a single entity has to generate. Yeah, sure. Itself, <laughs> but yeah, but that's true also for all kind of Genesis blocks, right? I mean, at the beginning of the network, um, you you can before you I mean before you start the network, you can do the first settings on the on the chain and say um, that this Genesis block is not the the only um, only node which has access to the settings. You can also include others. So that would be the setup phase um, before you start the network and in, include or, or uh, invite all the other members. OK. Um, so and it also, I don't know why we can't see the whole screen. Um, it also creates um, keys for a, for a user, which we will use now. So let's see if it is to Running, yeah, it's still running. Um, I think some have problem keeping this running, so we can have a look at this in the break yeah. and see if we can troubleshoot this together. But at this moment, we need a new tab to. Um, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Is that visible? Yeah? Okay. Okay, let's look. Let's have a look. Uh, yeah, it doesn't look very readable. Um, you see all the different um, container and their names. The names are just important in case we want to jump into a container, which we will need. For example, we want to use the client. So what we do is we just start. Yeah, these are the same. I mean, all these containers are coming from this configuration file and defined here. So it's the same. Um, one thing we didn't talk about is um, port mapping, which is um, uh, which will which will help us to communicate from the host to the container. The container are um, in, in this Docker Compose file, they are in a network, in a Docker network, so they, can, they don't need any mapping. Uh, they can drag the address together. There's a kind of DNS um, resolution in that. 
Okay, let's just start a bash um, session and for the client. So let's look for the names. After the break, we'll narrate so that you can actually look at yeah, it. Yeah, I need to. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. But I can also take from here the, the name, right? So that's going to be the name of the container I, I need to jump in. How to complete works for this? How to complete what? Yeah, how to complete works. Ah, okay. Nice. That's good to yeah, no, doesn't work. <laughs> this is the this is the configuration file, not the container. So, the shell we need. Now we are in the container for the for the shell. So if you um, look into into the course, go back here. you will see a better overview than the file about this basic network, about this first network we start. So, they are the container, they, this is how they uh, communicate. So the client will send requests to the API, which will send or forward <laughs> to the validator, and the validator will communicate with all the transaction <laughs> processors. And these are, these are example processes that the network was started with. So you've got, uh, you've got these three. Um, one is tic-tac-toe, one is a key value store, and you've got the, the settings one. Yes. And I think we will play with all of them. So see what we can do with them. <laughs> So, because of um, port mapping, we can also call the API from our host. So it's something um, something we could just test, which isn't so interesting. But <coughs> let's just do it. So we need again another terminal because we count it from the container. It will be different in the container. So. That's, um, well, what, what kind of call do or request do we have here? It is um, the blocks, which will show us the blocks we have at the moment. It is just the Genesis block. We didn't do anything on the, on the blockchain yet. And, and you can see here pretty much the structure also um, from, the, from the definitions we saw before. So you will see um, you will see it works different if you are in the container. It isn't local host anymore. It, you can directly call REST API, and this this is um, basically the process of Docker networking. So it can it can resolve this domain name here and point to the right one. I'm not going to show this. It is not very very interesting. Um, this comment here is the first time we use the client to run this. This is not a um, HTTP request anymore. This is a client call. So let's do it from here. So, and this is a list of the blocks. So it's still just one here. Well, um, there is a command line interface um, reference, which you can have a look. You will see there are a lot of commands um, to get a lot of different information from the blockchain, but also um, to use FL transaction families. So some transaction families are directly integrated and directly integrated in Southwood, like settings, for example. Um, like settings, all I think we have. 
and also identity. So we will also we will also see how identity works. Um, yeah, I think you can um, find the um, URL for this command line interface in the in the content. And because we start now to break, just play and try to get some information from the from the uh, blockchain, which isn't very interesting before you um, create a transaction. Perhaps we should just yeah. just create a transaction to have to have something going on. Yeah, something going on to see what happens. Something. So let's go back to here. Um, we will talk soon about this transaction family. Let's just, um, well, I need to include the container is not running in it. Let's see, and different one, XO, 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 here. Um, so this is the tic-tac-toe transaction family that yeah. is it's an example. No, it is, it is, it is also integer K is also yeah. included already. Okay, so let's um, just test something very fast. Let's set a key so for, and a video. This, uh, in, the, um, in the container, you can directly access, um, so that there's basically an interface <coughs> for the transaction family. So if you call in key that, um, that implements the, the API calls, you don't necessarily automatically have yeah, we, will, we will talk about this. We will have a look at the, how this transaction um, family works. It's a very basic one. But um, for now, just, just to have something, just to change something on a blockchain, use the set command. Um, so now we have a new transaction. And let's see, we have a new block. So you can set some, some um, keys and values and then try the different comments um, for the command line interface and see how ki which kind of information we can get from the blockchain. So in, in, what happened here, a transaction was crafted and was sent into the network, which obviously is very small in this case, validated uh, the transaction processor, processed the, what is kind of the function call in, within the transaction family, uh, the transaction is added to a batch, and the batch is added to a block, and the block gets accepted. But we, we will go. We, we will show the the steps. They are going. On. Yeah. All right. Cool. So play around with this a little bit. Um, have a look at the other commands. It get is not. Familiar. It is not about this transaction family. Play with the command line interface to yeah. see, and and play also with the. You will find a uh, um, link also for the REST API. Just play with it, see um, how a response looks like, and uh, let's see cool. And if there's any errors, we'll run now. So we have a 20 minutes break now. I would assume there's maybe coffee outside. <laughs> I hope there's coffee outside. So now's the time to get coffee and to troubleshoot if there's anything. <laughs>